Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study as we continue in this last leg of our journey in the ninth chapter of the book of Romans. So as uh, folks start to tuning in and welcoming you to the chat tonight, to the Bible study, if you'll start to let me know who's here and joining us. I would appreciate that, as always. And while you're doing so, I'll start us on our psalm of the day to, to get our minds set right and to, to get to, to get our hearts settled. And uh, so today's the 15th of July, so we would have the 15th, the 45th, the uh, 75th, the 105th, and the 135th psalms to choose from. And tonight I want to read from the 75th Psalm. I, I think that is uh, very fitting for our passage tonight. Hi, Celine and Aunt Faye and Sarah. Thank you guys for logging in the chat there. I see a few others are on. So um, let me begin reading the 75th Psalm, and you can uh, continue to log in there as, uh, as you will and just greet the, the rest of the class. Psalm 75. To the choir master, according to Do Not Destroy, a song of Asaph, a song. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks, for your name is near. We recount your wondrous deeds. At the set time that I appoint, I will judge with equity. When the earth totters and all its inhabitants, it is I who keep steady its pillars. I say to the boastful, do not boast, and to the wicked, do not lift up your horn. Do not lift up your horn on high or speak with haughty neck. For not from the east or from the west and not from the wilderness comes lifting up. But it is God who executes judgment, putting down one and lifting up another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed, and he pours out from it. And all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. But I will declare it forever. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked I will cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be lifted up. Hi, Gene. We see a God who judges rightly, perfectly, and that no one can stand before him in their boasting. So... Will you join me as we have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our time of uh, studying God's word tonight. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for yet another opportunity to gather together. Uh, those separated in space, Father, you have enabled us to have this technology and the ability that we can still study your word remotely and distantly and still have some interaction. And Father, we just thank you for uh, grounding us and uh, showing us exactly your perfect justice and your perfect love. Father, in all of its wonder, it gives us great confidence and great assurance that, Father, we know that you will set all things right. And also, Father, as we look at the, the, the boasting and the, the pride um, that inhabits all of us, uh, but when we see it in those who resist you, who 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 deny your son, who refuse to uh, bend the knee and bear the neck to you in submission and humility, that we remember we were once uh, enemies of yours and that your justice was justly pointed at us and that in your grace and your mercy, you have spared us. So, Father, we... We ask that in a sense of humility, there are many who shake their fist at you, that are many that are denying your name, and that you patiently bear with them. As we consider this psalm, and as we consider your word in Romans tonight, and putting it all together, Father, we want to give you glory uh, for your greatness, and pray that you would help us tonight, that your word would be clear to us, that your lessons would be understood and that they would settle not just on our minds, but in our hearts, Father, that we would give you glory and praise and not seek to lift ourselves up. And we thank you, Father, for your spirit's work in our 
hearts and in our minds to give us understanding, to, to, to give us understanding in your word, to enlighten your word and to instruct us and to convict us. And Father, we ask that you would bless our time tonight, that it would be for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we are, as I mentioned, we are going to finish our study in Romans 9. And so I'd like to invite you to turn there with me tonight. And just briefly, we're going to recap. So as we finish this chapter, we want to remember what Paul has been laying out for us. And he has given us tremendous insight into the genuine love in his heart. He is showing the conviction um, that it pains him to see that so many of his fellow countrymen are denying God's son. And then he begins to answer when someone would say, yes, your, 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 your presentation of the gospel, that Jesus Christ saves sinners, and that when he has saved sinners, he has brought them into union with himself. He's the ever-loving Lord, and he has victory over death and the grave. And so our union with Christ as Christians, we're secure forever. Well, Paul, if that's the case, what happened to God's people in the Old Testament. And we can understand that question today. And I hope in our time, as we've broken this chapter down, that it's really helped us to think through this and to understand, you know, how these objections would come, how these questions might be uh, verbalized to us and, and um, what, what kind of resistance, obviously, that we, that we know we're going to receive. Because what's going to happen is that when man, when prideful man is confronted with the truth of his sin and that there is this one exclusive way of salvation, which is only by the blood of Jesus Christ, then all kind of excuses are going to start coming out as to why that this doesn't, I don't believe this. I can't make sense of this. I don't want to believe this. And so the first one is they start pointing to, well, God doesn't keep his word. And that really is what set the tone. And so as Paul's working through these objections, He's answered that not all Israel's been was promised salvation, that God had this electing purposes. And it says that his uh, purposes in election would would continue, not fail. And it's not because of the works of man. It's it's God's sovereign choice of whom he will save and whom he will pass over. And so as he goes through, he took us. Uh, through the Old Testament, he takes us back to Genesis and reminds us of the call of Abraham. He calls us, uh, uh, reminds us the call of Isaac and not Ishmael, uh, of Jacob and not Esau, and that God's choice does not depend on any conditions of man. It's solely on his sovereign good pleasure. And so he takes us back into Genesis again on that. Um, and he also takes us into Malachi, um, where he is answering, look, it's Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. And so the natural question that's going to flow off of that is, well, there's some injustice on God's part. And so Paul says there is no injustice on God's part. Um, he will be glorified and magnified in his salvation of any sinner and that every sinner is, is deserving of his wrath. And he will, in fact, harden whom he hardens and he'll show mercy to whom he shows mercy. And so he shows us again, taking us through Exodus uh, 33 and Exodus 9, where he holds up um, the the event. And we spent some time last week um, looking at the passage with the uh, children of Israel and their blatant sin right after the covenant was promised uh, back to God that they would follow him and do all that he said. And then they make a golden calf and commit spiritual adultery. And uh, so we see that God says, I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And it's his divine prerogative to do so. And so as Paul works through these issues, we finally land on our text in, in verse uh, 19. And so basically, Paul says, listen, all of these objections you have, they're wrong. And it is absolutely perfectly just of God to do as he seems fit, because we, our sense of good and our sense of justice is horribly skewed. Uh, just rehearse the opening uh, chapters of this book. 
And so as we move into verse 19, and we are in fact in deep, deep waters, we understand that. And this is good. This is very good for us uh, because it grounds us, it humbles us, and uh, it gives us proper perspective. And this particular passage here, uh, as we finish this chapter, it is just stunning. I, I hope uh, that as we spent this time in the, this chapter, that it has helped you think about really what's at stake here. And it's the character and integrity of God, his perfection and his nature and his goodness. There is no injustice with God. There is no unfairness with God. There is mercy and kindness and love. And there is also justice and wrath. And we have to understand these. And so let's read our passage tonight and we'll get into our time of study. Uh, you will say to me then, in verse 19, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? Verse 20. But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make, one, to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. So let's let's backtrack and piece this together. And we're going to find out Paul's answer is not the answer that we would expect. And it is it is absolutely remarkable. So let's get to the question. The question is, okay, God's not unjust. He shows mercy to whom he will. And he appointed Pharaoh to stand and hardened him so he would show forth his wrath so that he would be glorified. So it doesn't matter. This is the question. The question might be asked like this. Uh, since nobody can resist God's perfect plan, predetermined, predestined plan, what does it matter? Do my choices really matter? We all just a bunch of robots. Uh, it's all been laid out. I, I we don't have any choice in the matter. And but Paul answers this question because it's a there's a couple here. Number one, it, do my choices really matter? And number two, since they don't, then God is really the one who's to blame here. Because he made me like that. It's my nature. I didn't have a choice in the matter. That's, that's what's at stake. So the question, if God sovereignly decrees or makes all these things in his sovereign decrees and has predestined it all, then I'm not guilty. And here we have in this passage, we have a, a, the, the great mystery of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. But I want you to pay attention to how Paul answers this question. So the question is posed that way. And this is what oftentimes it makes us uncomfortable when somebody says something like that. And we like, ah, I don't know. Uh, you know, my goodness, how would you have answered this question? Have you thought about this? This, is, this has been just really just amazing to me as I've been teaching through this chapter and meditating on it and really thinking through the brilliance of Paul's 
response, Paul's argumentation, Paul's flow of thought. It is just absolutely stunning. It's so remarkable to me. And what Paul basically does here is he says, stay in your lane, bro, right? We know that. Uh, there is a creator and there is a creation. And we need to know which one's who's who. And so when the objection finally comes, well, I'm not at fault. It's all God's fault and nobody can thwart what he does. Paul's response is not to, well, let's, you know, I could, I could see your, I could see your point there. I, I can see why you're feeling that way. Just straight up returns the question with a question a pure brilliance that says, who do you think you are, oh man? Who, who are you, oh man, to answer back to God? We fight the very same issues today, especially in our PC culture, political co correctness. Don't dare offend anybody or show that there is an absolute exclusive, absolute truth, one way of salvation, and there is one sovereign, God Almighty created, and everything else is created. He is totally other than his creation. We are also fighting a very long history, especially when we can speak to our American churches, our context, this very bad teaching that has been going on that God is just some benign, benevolent, fat old grandpa in heaven with peppermints in his pocket. And all he ever wants to do is just give you peppermints and puppies all the time. And we want to, um, I'm trying to choose my words carefully. We want to feminize. We want to take away the hard edges and soften everything up we in our so many churches you look there take take the cross out of the pulpit that that that's really hard you know that's really offensive to people and if we just do some kind of cool contemporary thing and we had some cool like a ted talks on stage where i got my little lectern and my little headset and i'm real cool and cheek and i'm on a you know, just come down to your level and we're just, hey, we're all just trying to figure this out, man. And the distinction, the separateness of the church today in our culture is a direct reflection of that. Gone is the smoke thundering around Sinai. Gone is the fear of man um, fearing a holy God and fearing the wrath of God. And it's this whole, I remember some time ago, Celine went to, I think it was the last women's conference that, um, that the church, I think, properly went to or had some folks go to. And she went to this conference. I'll never forget it. She came back. She was so offended. She said, you know, I'm done with these, these cheeky, feel-good conferences because this lady gets up in front of thousands and thousands and thousands of people in Nationwide Arena and she just goes on to talk to God like, hey, oh, God, how are you doing, buddy? Just no respect. Just like, hey, uh, did you want my autograph while I'm here? Because I'm some big shot, you know. It was disgusting. And she said it just struck me by just the frivolous, uh, flippant, un reverent attitude of approaching and God is because everyone wants to, Oh, he's just a good, good old guy. Just good old friend. He's my buddy. He's my homeboy. You know, he, we get down uh, <sighs> gangster sign, all that kind of thing down with me like that. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I'm taking a little liberty here, but I've actually, I've heard people. And I, I don't know, I probably mentioned this before just cause it really, it really disturbs me badly. Um, on, I think it was Sid Roth or one of these charismatic guys on the radio and gets these people on. They say, oh, well, you know, God, God and I are so tight, you know, and I was just out on the golf course and I was going to use a pitching wedge and, you know, God messes with me from time to time. And he said, hey, won't you use that three iron? That pitching wedge is bad. And I said, oh, God, I don't. Well, if you say so, I mean, are you kidding me? Is, is this what we're pandering? The, the holy God who thundered? 
and said, I will not share my glory with another. Do we like Psalm 75 that he will break the horns of the right. I'll break the teeth of my enemies. I will, I will shatter them. And with an everlasting judgment, Jesus himself says there is weeping and gnashing of teeth and utter darkness and unquenchable fire. So this is um, it's really relevant for us today, as you can see. So what Paul, let's get back to our text here. Why does he then find fault? Who can resist his will? And Paul just says, who are you, old man? To answer back to God. And just so we're clear on this, because we have talked about some things that are um, not very popular in a lot of circles um, that, you know, hey, God just looked down to see how people would respond. And there was some some good responses. And he thought, I'm going to save that one. I'm going to turn over my sovereign abilities to salvation and, and let man make his choice, you know, and that kind of stuff. If ever there was a time where Paul could have said, you know, hey, let me back up here just a minute so I'll make sure I'm not being misunderstood. You know, I, it doesn't happen. This, this would have been the time for him to do that. This would have been the time for him to say, yeah, there's maybe some, you know, conditions that he would want to save somebody. And it, it really has, has a lot to do with man's uh, choice here and his free will to choose. It, it is not here won't be here. Paul did not teach that doctrine. If you teach that doctrine, you don't get this kind of objection in response to it. So by the very fact that this is being raised ought to be very pointedly clear to us. It's exactly as it's laid out here. And so his response is, uh, you know, your question, when you ask a question of God, that you ask it all right. But this kind of question is out of bounds. This kind of question that impugns God, it relieves you of your responsibility and puts it all on God, is the wrong question. And he doesn't even address that. He says, who are you, old man, to answer back to God? It shows our arrogance. And what it really shows is what a low view of God that we have. Uh, Adversely, by the same time, it really lifts up and shows just how high of an opinion we have of ourselves and our sense of judgment, our sense of right, our sense of fair. Um, to have the audacity to impugn the holy and perfect character of God is completely out of bounds, and it is pure arrogance. If you remember Brother Fred's statement, I love it, was pride is the last thing to go. That is shining clear out of this text. And in fact, it's the arrogance of man that Paul takes straight aim at. He says, how, how dare you answer back to God? So they say, well, that's not fair and God's mean. And, you know, a, a very important thing to note out of this is that, yes, the, the answers are going to be offensive because we're all our own little sovereign monarchs. We're all our own self-absorbed. Um, the universe revolves around me. Everything's about me. And uh, when that, when the truth of God cuts across that, that's going to be offensive. But, you know, we don't have to be offensive in the way that we respond. The message will be offensive because it's going to, to shed the light on men's darkness happened to us, right? We who have been recipient recipients of God's grace, it's the very we know that full well. But there's also there is no willy nilliness here. There's no there's no um, whimsical. There's no flippant. Th this is a very serious thing, and there is a time. Um, there's lots of times. There's plenty of this is this is one of those times when this isn't a time to deal with this with a light hand. Um, you don't, you don't impugn God. You don't, God is not your debtor. God does not owe you and I any kind of an answer. And that's going to, that's going to hurt your feelings probably. Um, so be it. So Paul says, 
that the universe does not revolve around you. Know your place. You've forgotten your place. You're out of joint. You don't demand an answer from God as to his sovereign decrees and whom he chooses and whom he passes over and whom he elects. You, you don't go that far. God did not allow you and I into his eternal counsel before the world began when he made his purposes of election and laid things out. He did not invite you and I into that. And so you can see why that is very upsetting because uh, we're all a bunch of fact checkers now. We're all a bunch of uh, Google mites and buddy, I'm going to find that answer somehow. And somebody owes me an answer by golly. And um, Paul does not play with that. He does not entertain that. And so we haven't even made it out of verse 20. We could really spend a whole lot of time there. Um, but let's let's move on and let's let's consider why why this is so bad of a question. Questions asking God rightly, humbly seeking answers, faith seeking understanding, right on, absolutely. But this is not one of those cases. And when God, who's made the earth and everything in it, God who never learns anything, He knows everything perfectly. God, who spoke everything into being, it says he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Um, he's everywhere present. Where in there, where in that, just a few little things to ponder, did, did we find any equality or equal standing with, with God on that? It's, it's not. It's not there because we don't have that. Only God does. And so what Paul uses is an analogy uh, it, it was a very well-known illustration, but it would have been very understandable. He says, "What will what is molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? There's no finding fault with God. And we do not form ourselves. We are created. And so God who is the only one who created has absolute sovereign freedom to do exactly as he deems right, perfect, and just. So we don't put God on the defense stand. We don't put God on the stand and rattle him with questions and demand answers and pass judgment on him. We've got the whole thing upside down, if that's, if that's the approach. And again, it goes back to the arrogance and pride of man. And so, let's look at verse 21. Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? And there's been a lot of creative ways folks have tried to deal with this potter clay analogy and uh, lifting it out of any other context other than salvation issues uh, because that's what's raised these objections would be wrong so I might want to deal with those because I don't even think they are I don't even think they're worthy of spending time on it it's trying to force something into the text that isn't there so these are clearly does the potter have the right for one for damnation and for another for salvation mercy to one wrath to another and the answer is absolutely he absolutely does he is the potter and so as i was telling you we've spent a lot of time in jeremiah the, the the quotation actually is very close to the text in isaiah 29 um so we can look there for just a moment um i know last week we did a lot of uh contextual Reading, but I think the quotations just uh, they make their point. So I won't build a whole lot on that. Spend a lot of time there. But in Isaiah twenty nine sixteen, uh, actually twenty nine fifteen, he says, "Ah, you who hide deep from the Lord your counsel, whose deeds are in the dark, and who say, who sees us? Who knows us? You turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay that the thing made should say of its maker, He did not make me." Or the thing formed, say to of him who formed it, he has no understanding. So this is not an, anything new. 
And I think what ought to be crystal clear to us is that the uniform evidence and um, statements of the Bible from the Old Testament now to the New is one cohesive statement and declaration of God's sovereign right. And clearly the objectors um, wondering, well, did God not keep his promises? He didn't do so to Israel. Well, yeah, yeah, yes, he does. And so you have that, um, that reference in Isaiah. Um, he'd use it again at near the end of Isaiah. Isaiah would say again in uh, 64. Uh, but now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are the work of your hand. Be not so terribly angry, O Lord, and remember not iniquity forever. Behold, please look, we are your people. And it goes on to say, but the analogy is, again, very well understood. A potter has absolute authority to do with the clay as he wills. And so some of the objection is, well, you know, I don't really know if that's a salvation thing. I said I wouldn't deal with it. But I think one that might make kind of sense is where somebody says, why would a potter make a, a jar just to destroy it? And that's fine to ask that of man, but you don't ask that of God. That's the real simple, short answer to that one. And those analogies, when they're used and allusions and um, examples, illustrations, they're not meant to be filled all the way out to the exact every single last letter. The point of the thing is there's one person at the wheel and the thing's spinning around and he's got the sponge and the water. Uh, well, I'm going back to my seventh or eighth grade pottery class. So I can actually relate to this. Um, matter of fact, people probably saw the stuff I made said, man, he intended to make some messed up stuff. Eh, I just wasn't skilled. Uh, but basically there's one sitting at the wheel and the thing on the wheel being spun around and the water's being applied to it and the sponge and the hand and the force and the heat, that thing's pretty much that lump of clay is just sitting there taking that and being shaped and formed. And it's ludicrous that the thing would look back at the potter and shake its fist. How, how dare you put my handle there? Why? Are, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's comical if it wasn't such a, uh, a such a serious uh, situation. Uh, but as a, as we've been looking through, as I've been spending a lot of time in Jeremiah, there's a very graphic instance in Jeremiah 18 where God tells Jeremiah to, you know, go to the potter's house. And I like how God says this. He says, you know, arise and go down to the potter's house and there I will let you hear my words. Now that right there just sets the tone. You know, Jeremiah, go down to the potter's house. I'm going to let you hear my words. And so then he says, I went down to the potter's house and there he was, the potter at the wheel and the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand and he reworked it into another vessel. And actually in the Hebrew there, it's this, it, as he was continually making these, uh, this was happening. Uh, but in any event, as it seemed good to the potter to do. And so basically then the word of the Lord came to me and said, oh, house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done? declares the Lord, behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. And he basically says, if any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I'll pluck it up, break it down, destroy it. And if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I'll relent of the disaster that I had intended to do to it. And if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I build and plan it, if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I had intended to do to it. Now, go say to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord, I am shaping disaster against you and devising a plan against you. Return everyone from his evil way and amend your deeds. And they basically object to that. So then he tells him, he says, well, go buy this bottle or jar or flask, whatever your translation may have it. And he says, you break it. And basically that's what I'm going to do to this city. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a statement of judgment. And so this would have been a very well understood, uh, has not the potter, uh, has the potter no right over the clay. And so that speaks to the purposes of God alone. And 
there's reasons why God makes some vessels for honor and others for dishonor, some for mercy and some for wrath. Who are you, O man, to question God? And so it puts things in its proper perspective. He is the potter. We are the clay. And it's very straightforward, and it's a very simple illustration, and it's a very pointed, direct, and easily grasped and understood illustration. So he goes on as we work through this, um, and he says, well, you know, the, the original question was, can he still find fault? Well, put that all together. And he says, is, is he morally responsible? You know, the problem of evil will come up in this discussion a lot of times. If, if, the, if God's determined all this and yet evil still exists, then there's some problems here because God's either not powerful enough to, to prevent the evil or he's not good enough to stop it. And we can't spend a that that is a whole topic for another lesson, um, another time. It's a very enriching one. Uh, it's actually one I wrote my most recent paper on. So um, I spent a lot of time tangling with that one. And basically, you have this passage in Romans, and I think another one that really puts the exclamation mark on we don't we don't begin to know why there are vessels for wrath and vessels for honor, why there's evil ultimately. The answer is not given because it is in the sense that God is sovereign. He has his purposes. He's perfect in all of his ways, that he has ordained all these things for a reason and a purpose. And number one, it's that God will not share his glory with another and he will be glorified. That is the reason he makes man. He'll be glorified in the salvation of sinners out of that whole mass lump. It was all bad that he would choose to save some, that's the that's the stunning thing out of all this. And so it always shows our approach to this when somebody says, well, that's not fair, or that's not good, or that's not right. We totally got the whole picture upside down. Our, our understanding is, is, is really faulted and faulty, rather. Uh, but let me just take you back briefly to the book of Job. I've got a few minutes uh, here, and we, we can we can get this in. Because this is another point in scripture where God basically will stand up a man and correct the issue. And really chapter 38, 39, 40, and 41 of Job does this in a manner that is just crystal clear. You make it out of that and we truly understand our, our place. We get put in our place. And Romans 9 is another one. Uh, but basically in 38, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. And he said, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you and make it known to you. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell, uh, tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Uh, who, who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or, or who shut in the sea with doors? And when it burst out from the womb, when I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far shall you come and no further. And here shall your proud waves be stayed. Now, right there, I mean, I mentioned on Sunday the really foolish thing that I did going down to the beach during a tropical storm. But you know how insane it would have been for me to say, hey, ocean, I'm drawing a line in the sand, bucko boy, and you better not cross it because I'm Bill Merolt. And I'm... And that... Probably the next thing would happen would be a 40 foot wave that just swallow me up, you know, just destroy me in an instant. That's what I would deserve for something stupid like that. Um, but let's get back to Job. Um, you know, have you commanded the morning? He goes on to say, Have you entered the springs of the sea? Have you walked 
in the recesses of the deep. I mean, we have equipment of our finest materials that crush like a little Dixie cup because of the pressures. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Um, have the gates of death been revealed to you? Um, I mean, have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? I can't comprehend the expanse of Grove City. Uh, the city of Columbus taxes me with however many people we have. And I, it's, 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 a, it's a very small part, portion of the earth. And he says, have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all this. And let me move on because verse or chapter 40, he says, shall a fault finder contend with the almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. Then Job answered the Lord and said, behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. And the Lord says, dress for action like a man. I will question you and make it known and you make it known to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be right? What a question. What a question. Have you an arm like God? And can you thunder with a voice like his? Adorn, your, adorn yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on everyone who has proud and abase him. Oh, my goodness. So go back and read chapters 38, 39, 40, and 41 of Job uh, to really get a sense of where we're out of bounds. And I think one of the, one of the brilliant things is the question is, is not answered. Man is not even dignified with, hey, I'm going to get to that. Here's how I'm going to answer that. I'm going to answer that, and I'm going to tell you that I am the sovereign God, and you are a man. I made you. When I tell you to stand, you stand. Are you going to accuse me of wrong? Are you going to put me in the wrong so that you're right? It's the same argument here in Romans 9. And here's another one that really just pops in the mind. Say God did answer that question. Let's just let's just say, he, all right, I'm going to I'm going to let him into the deep deep counsels and I'm going to lay this knowledge on you. What are you going to do with that? You ever thought of that? Job, he says in Job, you don't even know when the mountain goats calf. You can't even comprehend that. But you want to know the way deep things of my eternal counsel. You, you can't even stop a wave. You didn't set a star in the sky. You, you didn't even, you can't even walk in 12 feet of water, let alone 30 miles deep of water. You can't even comprehend this yet. You want to know the deep and eternal counsels of God, the mind which knows no limits, knows no bounds, never needs to be taught anything, sees everything, even into the heart of man. So suppose, suppose I answer that. What are you going to do with that knowledge? You see the arrogance and the pride, and we are all guilty of that. Myself, oh my goodness, I had... back to Romans nine. I'm thinking that I got a lot of thoughts running through my mind. But basically, when we would turn this around and say, you know, God, I don't think this is fair. I don't think it's right and just that you pass over some, that you've made some for destruction, that you harden Pharaoh and Judas and however many others that you have done so for your perfect uh, uh, purposes. So you need to explain yourself to me so I can determine whether you are worthy of my worship or not. That's what it really comes down to. Have you thought of that? So Paul says... God's the potter. Does he not have any right over the clay to make one out of the same lump, one vessel for honorable and another for dishonorable? What, what if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? 
in order to make the riches of his glory for the vessels of mercy, which he has prepared before him for glory. So the whole doctrine of predestination, the whole doctrine of unconditional election, none of these things should truly upset us when we understand that we are all wicked, we are all evil, we have no power, we made nothing, we have no standing. And God in his goodness has, has shown his mercy. That's what really shines out of this. This is the bleak picture that it was. And it's perfectly right that God would wipe everything out. He said he endured with much patience in verse 22. Check this out in three ways. God justly could have wiped every single one of us out, all of us, every single man. Because in chapter 3, everybody was indicted. We're all guilty. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He rightly and justly could have wiped us out and never let us see it. A second, a nanosecond of sunlight or life or breath or any of that. Or the moment that a man sins, the moment that a man sins and becomes aware of it, just wipe him out. And just in the most horrific punishment. And he doesn't. Have you thought about the grace of God in that? And there goes the whole objection to fairness. That really kind of just loses its, its luster at that point. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, what else does he say here? God patiently bears with sinners, rebels, and enemies, and his enemies, and shows them even common graces where the most wicked of people can enjoy a good, juicy, fat ribeye steak, or in my case, a nice piece of chicken breast and a salad, mm, grapefruit, uh, to see the beauty of a sunrise, to know the, uh, the love for, uh, for, uh, for a man from his wife in, in the common grace of marriage or a wife, her husband, to, to even have that or to laugh. My goodness. I mean, it's great to have a moment of joy and laughter and to share that with somebody and to, to even experience those kind of things. If you consider the incredible grace and mercy and kindness of God for that, and, and what else does he say here? He says that this mercy that it was shown to those whom he has elect, those whom he has chosen, knowing what judgment that he's going to hold up and declare to us who have been called, New creations in Christ Jesus, saved by the blood of the Lamb, that it pleased the Father to crush his Son on the cross so that we would be co-heirs with Christ's inheritance of glory and unrighteous, unholy, wicked, sinful haters of God would be given a new heart and a, and a heart that loves him. And that we could stand in his presence because of Christ's blood on us that has saved us. Indeed, the glory of God and the mercy of God really is what stands out here. So we do have this mystery. We do have this very difficult to us doctrine of God's sovereignty on one hand, and man's responsibility and culpability on the other. It's not an issue whatsoever for God. And there again, the beauty of this passage, he is God and we are not. So when God doesn't deign to give us answers to our questions, what he does call us to do is to trust him and to know that what he is doing is perfect. Jump back to Romans chapter 8, right? He works all things, right? Not some things. He works all things. Let's move on. For the good of those whom he has called, for those who love him. 
And so Paul says in verse 25, he goes back to the prophet Hosea, and he says, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. So what we're having here is really quite striking when he says, now, my Jewish brethren, who right now grieves my heart to no end, that I would be, I'd be willing to be cursed if that were possible, so that they would know the love and salvation of Christ and come and turn from their sins and turn to him. That God's promises have not failed to his people. And that the idea of a remnant, we're going to get to that. But here in Hosea, a people who are not my people, that's us, Gentiles, right? The, the, the whole concept was of God's mercy. Those who weren't deserving it have been showed that. You as a Jewish people, you know this because there is nothing in you that brought you favor to me. It was my sovereign choice of you. And I chose to put my name with you. I chose to lead you by fire and by a pillar of, of, of cloud and to give you manna in the wilderness and to give you quail and to give you water and to put my name amongst you and to tabernacle with you and to bring my son through you. Go back to the very opening of nine and those incredible privileges that were shown to the people of Israel. And he says, you understand the hardness on Pharaoh. You understand the glory that was shown when I delivered you out of his wicked hand. You rejoice to that. And you were supposed to be my nation of priests. You were supposed to show them a light into the Gentiles. As my prophet said, Isaiah, you were supposed to be the ones who were to show the magnificence of my glory. Because there I was tabernacling with you and you did not. So now it is you who have been rejected. It is now you who have turned from me. And it's you who have been hardened. It is incredible when you think about this. And he says here, going to Hosea, you should have known mercy to a people who were not my people, right? And in an Isaiah, he says, and this is where we get the hope. And it goes right back to the very opening. The thesis of this is that God does not renege on his promises. And he is not powerless. And he is not forgetful. And he is not unfaithful. He is not whimsical and flippant. He is not like man. Love you one moment, give you the back the next. Uh, stand by you now, but the first sign of adversity, I'm skipping town. Um, this shacking up business. Uh, easy, just a, hey, I'm not going to marry anybody. I don't know what that commitment kind of stuff. Uh, stuff starts going bad, I'm out, right? So I don't get married. Let's shack up with you. And this ease of divorce. Ah, oh, it's gotten a little. This is what I signed up for. You know, you, all you do is sit around and pick your belly button lint out of your big hairy belly. I didn't sign up for that. I'm out. You know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, what I'm saying is, he says here, in Isaiah, the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea. Only a remnant of them will be saved. So God, God has not written off Israel. He's not done with the Jewish people, right? For the Lord will carry out a sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. The Gentile inclusion mentioned in Hosea should have been easily understood. The remnant of the Jews remaining in the promises of God should likewise be understood. And you notice what Paul has done here in this sweeping chapter of Romans 9. Have you noticed it? He has held up Genesis. He has held up Exodus. He has held up Hosea. He has held up Isaiah, the law and the prophets. Do you see it? The stunning reversal, Israel who knew mercy refused to give mercy, right? Israel who was shown such grace, grace and lavish love on them refused to show it to others. It became isolationist said, we've got Abraham as our father. Everybody else is wicked and bad. We don't dare sit at the seat of sinners. 
Isaac the younger, not Ishmael. Jacob the younger, not Esau. God's promises have not failed. Um, I'd like to, we've got just a few moments. There really is a lot. Um, I know we've spent four weeks in this, but we, there is so much that's left on the cutting room floor, I like to say. there's It's such a deep and profound passage. But when, when Paul is setting things right, and ultimately he gets down to this and says, you do not have the right to ask God out of your arrogance and your pride and demand of him and put him on the stand and pass judgment on God. Now, we don't understand things. We come to him in humility, thanking him for his grace, desiring that his glory be known, and be content when he doesn't answer our questions entirely. He has given us sufficiently everything we need to know. We who have been saved know the story of our sinfulness, know that desperate need of salvation we have, and that God is the one who made the way for that in his son, the blood of his son. And not only just the blood of his son and the crucifixion, but his death, his burial, and his resurrection, so that when he rose from the grave and fulfilled those prophecies and is seated at the right hand of the Father, now church, now church, now church, that we understand the grace and mercy of God. We who are outside have now been brought in. What do we do with that, right? Do we just sit on it? Do we just become like Israel? I think we've learned our lesson. I think we've seen what we are to do. We're to share that good news. We don't know. Yeah, Gene, uh, absolutely. Years ago, Gene shared, uh, Job 38 has always been, 38 to 41, has always been a very profound passage to me because um, and I'll just speak here. You can read Jane's comment. When her little boy died of uh, cancer, it took her into a very dark time and she was angry with God. And um, she admits a lot of the, the, the difficulties in that. And when I was hearing that, um, I'll be honest, the time when Jean was sharing that with me, you know, Celine sharing that perspective with her little brother. And it's just heart wrenching, you know, to hear that from my wife. But when uh, and my mother in law, given the perspective, you know, that that was my little boy, what drew her out of that was purely the word of God. A whole and Gene, you can tell me if I'm wrong here. I don't want to overstep my bounds. But ultimately, how do you how do you come to grips with the death of your 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 beautiful little boy? Stephen was such. I I can't wait to meet him in heaven. What Celine has told me about him uh, as such a light that God shone on this earth so brief a time, so brief a time, that shared Jesus with people that would, at great pains and discomfort, would go into other children's rooms in the hospital as he's dying of cancer, and he would go to cheer them up. Um, and the, the close bond that Celine had with him and the joy that he brought her. Um, and he dies of cancer and Jean with her, with her little boy, her precious little boy. And she did, how do you process that? It's the word of God. It's the word of God. And that's the, that's where Jean was said, I was sitting there and I was reading in Job when, where was I at when the foundations of the earth were laid? I wasn't there. I wasn't there. I, I'm not going to maybe have all the answers to this, but I can trust the God who laid the foundations of the earth, the God who gave me this little boy. Stephen was God's. Stephen was loaned, on loan to me. Nothing truly belongs to us. Everything has been entrusted to us by our wonderful creator. And though I don't understand it, and though I may not have all the A through Z reasons for it, I know this, that Stephen, in this case, is going to, he's spending eternity with God in the presence of the holy, giving praises and glory to the God he loved at so young an age. And that that story has had wonderful shafts of light of the, as Celine and Jean have been able to minister to other people going through times, not being able to say, I know what you're feeling like. I don't know that. But I've had my heart wrenched and I've had myself broken, but I know the love of God the strength of God, 
coming by the word of God and the spirit of God. And that's the only place of consolation that I could make it through something like that. I hope that encourages you tonight. Thank you, Gene, for bringing that up. Um, every time when I go to Job 38 to 41, I, I, I always think of that story. Um, let's close uh, with just a few points of application because I really want to tie this up. In this time, we have seen that God's promises have not and they cannot and they never will fail. So when you stand before somebody and you tell them that your sins will be as far as the east is from the west, when you have turned from your sin in heartfelt repentance and sorrow and have claimed Jesus and have acknowledged Jesus and have turned to Christ in faith and asked him for forgiveness for your sins, all who come to me, I will not turn away, Christ says. Then you are eternally safe in his hands. Nothing could separate you from the love of Christ. Romans 8, right? It's the very passage is this coming off of. So God's promises have not failed. He was not unfaithful to Israel. They were unfaithful to him. And even in spite of that, God promised to save a remnant. And so Paul has laid out what those promises actually were. So the, the question has been answered. This gives us, again, every assurance that we are safe in the eternal hands that were pierced on the cross for us, right? That God will not forsake us. He will never, never leave us forsaken us. And staying in the context of this, that God is true to his promises and that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing, nothing. And so that gives us great confidence. And we know that the reason this gives us great humility. That's a third point. We have confidence, Right. In God's promises, we have confidence in our uh, destination and our final destination and eternal life with God. But it gives us a tremendous sense of humility, knowing that it's nothing that we manufactured in and of ourselves, that God's choice of whom he will save and who he will not. When we receive this grace and mercy, we know it was nothing of our doing. And so. It gives us a tremendous sense of humility, no arrogance here. And that's why I wanted to really emphasize the beginning of this. This passage, a lot of people see it as hard and, and cold and, and, and arrogant, like we just scoff at those people who are left in darkness. Not at all. Not at all. But this is also meant to give us a reason and yet another reason and purpose is to praise and glorify God. And his purpose is why he has made us and shown us mercy is that we would glorify him. So I hope this is refreshed and renewed your, your profound love and appreciation for the mercy and kindness and love that he has shown you to show forth his glory and his praise. But also lastly, to share that with others as we get into Romans, uh, the last part of Romans nine here, rolling into Romans 10 of, uh, you know, Jew and, uh, the Israel and church relations and, and, and why, the zeal for evangelism is to be there. We're going to get another look into God's or into Paul's heart and his great love. But we also learn our place. And this is where we'll end that we learn how to ask God a right faith seeking understanding, but never impugning God for his character, never putting God on the stand, never passing judgment on him, never raising up in our arrogance that we would dare dare answer back to God in such a manner and that we know that he has absolute sovereign freedom to do exactly as he has planned to do. And it is perfect and right and good. Our sense of all those things are not. And we don't go around crying foul and seeking for fairness and all other kind of ways that we can blunt the edge of this. We trust God and what he's declared to us. We trust him in his salvation we trust him in his judgment. We trust him in all of that and try to have a well-rounded understanding of God, that he's not some big, fat, benevolent, kind old grandpa with, with those little peppermints and puppies and, and daisies and all kind of good stuff. Um, so let's close in a word of prayer and thank God for the time that we have that he's given us. Father, we thank you. We know that these uh, are very deep truths indeed. And we marvel at the wonder and perfection of your word. We're so sorry, Father, when we have done uh, the very thing that you have told us not to do in this passage. Father, that you would help us 
in humility to ask questions aright of you, to draw near to you, to trust you and what you have revealed to us by your grace and your mercy. And Father, that knowing the judgment that awaits others, that it creates in us and compels us to want to share the good news of the, the salvation that is only found in Jesus Christ, that we would fear you and not man. Father, that we would be willing to, to take our stand and to not blush when it comes down to the question of your fairness and your goodness, because we have your word. And Father, we know that you're sovereign in all that you do. So, Father, as we close our time tonight, we thank you for it. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Beloved, all who have joined in tonight, thank you again for joining. We, 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 have, uh, we have successfully walked through the passage of Romans 9. I hope the passages that we have covered have inspired you and that you will go back and read them and, and meditate on them and the whole council of scripture and uh, continue to pray uh, for one another, continue to pray for our leaders. And uh, thank you. I've gone a few minutes over. So thank you. Uh, and good night. God bless. Oh, hi, Amy. Sorry. I, I cut you right there at the end. Thank you. And uh, good night, everyone.